Let's discuss the concept of relative valuation. Now, relative valuation is a way of valuing something based on the value of something that is comparable. And this differs from valuation models like discounted cash flow, where what we're trying to do is figure out what the intrinsic value is by finding the present value of some future cash flows, for example, earnings or dividends. Now, there's some advantages and disadvantages to using relative valuation. For example, it can be completed with far fewer explicit assumptions than discounted cash flow. In discounted cash flow, you have to know what the um, discount rate is. You have to know what the uh, growth rate for earnings or dividends happens to be. You don't need those here. It reflects the current mood of the market, which may be a good thing. However, it ignores variables like growth, risk, and cash flow. And it may lead to valuations that are too high when the market is overly optimistic and too low when the market is overly pessimistic. And there's also no theoretical basis for which comparisons to use. Now, this is commonly done in real estate. Okay, sales per square foot for retail space, price of other similar home sales. Um, sometimes there's a housing boom. There happens to be one going on right now as I'm recording this video. And house prices are shooting up um, ridiculously. All right, is that what they're worth? Well, they're worth what the house across the street sold for, which is similar to your house. Um, you may use it for setting a price for reselling something or purchasing something on eBay or Amazon. Right? What do you do? You go through, you scroll through, you see what people are selling this item for, and you figure you can sell it for a similar price or maybe a little less. If you're buying it, you look to see what people are selling it for and um, you know, try and find the best deal you can. Um, you may use it for determining if you received a fair salary upon graduation. Right? What do you do? You go to some sites, find out what the average salary is, for a degree in finance or accounting, and you see whether that salary that you're being offered is similar. All right, or you may ask your friends what kind of offer they got. That's a way to figure it out. All right, you're not figuring out the present value of your future earnings and things like that. What you're doing is figuring out what are other people getting. If everybody else is getting 60000 and you're only getting forty five, you may consider that too low an offer. If everybody else is getting 60000 you get an offer for seventy-five, then maybe you want to jump at that offer. Um, values and multiples. Earnings multiples. Okay, This is the value of some multiple of the earnings that are generated. The price-earnings ratio is, is the most common you hear about. And what it does is it measures how much you're paying for one dollar of the company's earnings. You're taking price and you're dividing it by the amount of earnings. You can use the current earnings or the past earnings, usually TTM, trailing 12 months, or forecasted earnings, what we think earnings will be in the future. You can have book value or replacement value multiples. Price to book value looks at how much you're paying relative to the book value of the firm. You might have a revenue multiple. So price to sales looks at how much you're paying for each dollar of sales. This is a popular one when the firm has no earnings. Okay, Remember, earnings are not revenues or sales. That earnings are what you have after you pay off all the expenses. Um, price to cash flow is another one. And it's sometimes used because earnings can be affected by the firm's choice of accounting practices. Okay? Nothing shady, nothing illegal, but there are different methods for accounting. And um, that may affect what the earnings are. Cash flow um, tracks actual cash flowing into and out of the firm and is going to be less affected by accounting decisions. You have another one that was... Uh, that popped up in the late 90s, price to eyeballs or clicks. Um, this was very popular during the dot-com boom. And the reason it was popular is because these companies had no earnings. 
Okay, so if you have no earnings or negative earnings, then a price earnings ratio can't be used. It'll just give you a negative number. If you have zero earnings, you know, you can't divide by zero. All right, you'll just get a ridiculous answer. All right, at first glance, this seems ridiculous, but this is really how network TV works, right? Um, how does it work? How many people watch a show dictates how much they can charge for advertising. And that's how they make their money, right? Network TV, okay, most of us probably have um, cable or satellite TV, but you can have an antenna and watch network TV for free. The cost is watching advertising. And you may have noticed that, you know, many of these games or other things that you get are free, um, free apps that you get. Um, you have to pay, you have, the cost is not dollars, but you have to see some advertising. Um, there was actually a company back during the dot-com boom called buy.com. Then their plan was, we're going to sell items at cost. So they're going to be really cheap. People want to buy them, but we're going to make money on advertising. And that business model didn't work out too well. Uh, Facebook's another example, right? Um, Facebook does not charge sus subscribers, right? Some of you may have a Facebook account. You don't pay anything for the Facebook account, but because there are, you know, more than a billion users of Facebook, they're able to charge advertisers a significant amount of money for being able to reach your eyeballs. All right, let's look at a couple of comparisons here to wrap this up. Um, Measures of relative valuation differ not only among industries, but also among companies in an industry. So you got to be careful when you use this, right? You can't look at the PE, uh, for example, of the auto industry and compare it with the PE for, you know, some sort of technology business. It's going to be different. Um, and sometimes they differ significantly among companies within an industry. Okay. The P.E. ratio not only measures the price of a stock relative to its earnings, but it also accounts for the expectations of future earnings. So, you know, why are you willing to pay more for a dollar of a company's earnings, right? A dollar of earnings is a dollar of earnings because you think the company has greater prospects in the future. So on June 2nd, 2021, I happened to look up these three you know, well-known companies, Tesla. If you look at their price, $603.62. Okay, Amazon has a higher price, $3,219.28. And Berkshire Hathaway, that's not a typo, has a price north of $435,000. So this is the cheapest stock by price, second cheapest and most expensive. But let's look at their price earnings ratio. These are all trailing 12 months um, earnings. If you look at Tesla, they're actually the most expensive. You're paying 604, almost $605 for a dollar of Tesla's earnings. Okay, why is that? Because you're really optimistic about the future as we talk about climate change, many of the um, Auto companies are talking about moving into, you know, electric cars or totally into electric cars in the next, come, you know, few decades. Tesla is the one that's out there and has been pretty successful at delivering electric cars and batteries, etc. Okay, so you're really optimistic about them. You know, Amazon, on the other hand, okay, you're less optimistic about, but you're still pretty optimistic. That's a pretty high P.E., $61.18, okay? Traditionally, PEs have hovered around, I don't know, 15 to 20, maybe 25. Okay, they've gone up in years, and some people argue that technology has allowed PEs to be higher because of things like just-in-time inventory. But we're still pretty optimistic. Amazon continues to branch out into lots and lots of things. They have their... Um, um, Amazon Web Services, which is a an important part of the business, right? Not just selling retail. They're into a lot of other things like streaming music and streaming video. Um, again, as I record this, 
they're in the process of buying MGM Studios, and MGM Studios owns the whole library of James Bond movies, and they're trying to get more content for their Amazon Prime um, memberships. And then there's Berkshire Hathaway. This is the company Warren Buffett runs. Okay, traditionally a lot of a lot of insurance in there, and they own some sort of traditional retail businesses like um, Pampered Chef. Um, they sell cooking things through parties you have in the home. All right, they own um, uh, you know Dairy Queen and companies like that. They've invested in companies like Coca Cola, pretty traditional businesses. Okay. They are actually the least expensive based on the price earnings ratio. We're not real optimistic about how fast Berkshire Hathaway can grow. These are traditional businesses, good businesses. Coca Cola is a good business. All right? Some of these other businesses are very good businesses, very profitable. But we don't expect earnings to explode. Right? The insurance business is not going anywhere, but it's also not going to be shooting up. Okay? Tesla were optimistic as people move from gas-powered cars to electric cars. In fact, these days, there's a lot of talk about um, greenhouse gases and building homes that are all electric, so not having gas heater, you know, gas stoves and gas uh, furnaces and stuff, because electric, although it uses energy, you know, greenhouse gases to create now, it can be created with renewable sources like solar and wind. So what you see is, you know, people really optimistic about Tesla, okay? Um, also very optimistic about Amazon. And in the case of Berkshire, less optimistic. So you can see that relative valuation, the numbers change a lot. These are three different types of businesses, three different types of industries, and these can be quite significantly different. But it does give you a way to sort of value and compare different types of businesses.